Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I'm part of the Finding Genius Foundation. A quick note, Finding Genius Foundation has started on its anxiety and depression meta-study. So our goal is, if you go to any practitioner and you suffer from anxiety or depression or know someone that does, they'll probably have, let's say, 1% or 2% of all the possible treatments available. And our goal is to go over you know, 5,000 plus sources and see if we can assemble 20% plus of all the possible treatments for anxiety and depression. Uh, We call this the Codex. It'll be a guide for sufferers and associates of sufferers. So if you want to find out more about it, go to findinggeniusfoundation.org and we could use your support in terms of donations as well. So today, uh, my guest is Diana Reese. Uh, she has a PhD. She's the she's a professor and a director, uh, part of animal behavior and conservation, uh, MA and certificate programs, part of the psychology department at Hunter College. And again, all this is part of the um, New York University system. So we're going to talk today about her research. So Diana, thank you for coming. Hi, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, tell me, um, what got you interested in animal communication or maybe people communicating with animals? You know, like, What's your background and how did you come to this this research? Yeah, well, so I came from a, a pretty strange background, perhaps. My background was actually originally in art. I was very interested in art, but I was also at the same time interested in studying animal communication. I always had, had an affinity for other species. And, you know, as a kid, I had pets in my house and I was always fascinated about how they communicate. It, I actually worked in the theater for a period of time. And as a stage designer, I had been in an MA program in set design before I went into a PhD program in speech and communication sciences. And just to unpack that a little bit, I studied um, how humans communicate, how a little bit about how other animals communicate. We studied bioacoustics, and that's the study of how biological organisms, humans and other animals produce sound and how we analyze those sounds. And uh, I was interested in really trying to put together a toolkit so I could approach other minds and try to study how they communicate It wasn't until later, a little bit later in my studies, I got interested in the question of, could we come up with an interface for communication with other species? And of course, for those of you, for the listeners out there, most of you are thinking, well, I communicate with my pets. And that's that's right. We we develop communication with animals around us. But I'm talking about a way that scientists can actually study it and, and track it and be able to show that there's something pretty significant going on here. Well, I remember there's um, an example of Coco the gorilla that was taught sign language and had a kitten. And I interviewed Irene Pepperberg, who has the parrot Alec, or had you know, passed away. And he was able to say what color, what shape, you know, they were seeming to, they seem to be able to communicate on a very high level. But what's, um, like, what have you observed? Have, have any scientists made really breakthrough 
models where they can communicate with animals on a high level? Well, I think that so, the people that you just mentioned, uh, Dr. Irene Pepperberg, who was doing her work at Harvard, has shown extraordinary abilities for African gray parrots to learn what she calls functional communication. And she taught parrots that are that are known for being able to imitate human speech. She taught them labels, vocal labels, uh, for a variety of objects and actions and modifiers. And for over for over 30 years, she was demonstrating that these parrots were not bird-brained, as we often use that term. They were bird-brained in a new sense of the word. It's sort of awe-inspiring. Bird brain is no longer a negative term uh, from what we've learned about the abilities of birds. So for example, uh, I'm I'm fairly, I have to confess that I'm, I'm Irene Pepperberg's vice president of the Alex Foundation, her, her research foundation. It stands for oh, Avian cool. Language Experiment. So I just want to be upfront. So I'm pretty familiar with this work. But what's remarkable is that imagine standing or sitting in front of a bird, a, an African gray parrot like Alex or her other birds, and holding up a triangular piece of wood that's blue. And without changing what you're holding, you can say to that bird, what color? And the bird will say blue. And then saying, what shape? And they'll say three corner, which what they learned means triangle for uh, to us. What material or what matter? And it may be touching it and saying wool or wood or paper. That's remarkable that because the bird has to listen and comprehend and decode the question and then answer appropriately to that very same thing that it's looking at, that very same stimulus. We never thought other animals could do that, but now we know many can when we, when we give them these artificial codes. Well, like I know with my dogs, you know, my wife will say, Ooh, who's hungry? The dogs all come and go crazy and they I don't know if it's just the tone of the voice or if there's certain words we say that they actually remember and know. But I mean, you know, dogs know their names and they know commands. So absolutely, many yeah. animals have a have a vocabulary that they can use. Yeah, and what it's I'm glad you brought that up because um, for many pet owners, for many dog owners, I'm I'm one of them. You know, we're used to saying things and seeing our pets respond. And again, for years, it's been a question: Is it the way we say it? Is it the intonation? Is it because we're standing over their ball or walk standing up from a sofa at five o'clock when we feed them that they take in the whole context and they're not really understanding the words? Um, and it can be that because we do that a lot as humans. We, we take what are called, here's the fancy hundred dollar word, paralinguistic meaning things that go along with the words, the paralinguistic aspects. Um, but studies uh, over the past years have actually tested dogs' capacity to comprehend spoken words. And there are several dogs that have shown that they have, they have the ability to comprehend very specific words, hundreds of words under test control and control conditions. So every day we seem to learn more and more about the abilities of other species. And again, a lot of people will say, I told you so, I told you my dog was communicating. But through tests, we can really say that these animals are capable of comprehension. Uh, again, it depends on, you know, who's communicating as well and what, what, you know, how you're working with your pet. Doesn't mean that all dogs understand everything, but I think they're understanding more than we often give them credit for. So what animals do you focus on? Which, uh, which ones do you work with? I work with um, really big brained mammals. I, they're, they're, I study uh, these dolphins, which have the second bottlenose dolphins, which have the second largest brain uh, relative to their body size next to us humans and yeah. another gray animal, the Asian elephants. And um, it's been absolutely an honor for me to work with these big brains. And I try to work with them in ways where we can understand them more and in ways that will perhaps enrich their world because we give them things that will hopefully be fun for them to do. And at the same time, enriching our science. And then the last part is taking what we're learning and applying it in a way it, what we call translational science or what I call translational science to getting policies to protect them. And I think that's terribly important uh, for me and for other scientists now applying our science that we do for science sake, but applying it for glo you know, for global protection of these species. Mm -hmm. So what's it like to work with, uh, you know, a bottlenose dolphin or these other smart animals versus dogs or other animals? I mean, it, can you tell this creature is amazingly <laughs> smart? Yeah, well, I think dogs are really smart. Again, 
as well. I think different species are smart in different ways. With the dolphin and elephant, there's a similarity there that I find sort of very provocative. There, It's a different kind of intelligence. I think it's a different level of awareness that I felt with some of the other species I'm familiar with. In many cases, you know, I, I had a big, I do a lot of dog rescue with Newfoundlands and I've had Newfoundlands in my life. These are these big black water rescue dogs. And I remember someone, uh, I was had my dog on campus with me. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. And, you know, these dogs weigh about 150 pounds and they have long, shaggy, dark hair, black hair, and black fur. And somebody said, oh, it looks like there's somebody in there. And, and I said, there is somebody in there, you know, and there's a personality. There's a, there, it's not a person the way we think of us being people, but there right. is somebody in there. And with dolphins and elephants, they, these are, you feel like you're in the presence of very strong somebodies. And I, I've been, I've been talking to my colleagues a lot about this recently, that often we've been trained as scientists when we write about these animals that we, these the other animals that we work with, that we, we're, we're asked to call them it's in the literature. And I don't think they're it's at all. I think itification, and I've, I've, I think I've coined that term recently, really takes something away from these animals. They, they really do. Um, they should be called he's and she's, in my opinion, not yeah. it's. And uh, it's, it's something I'm pushing a lot now, but they're, these are distinct personalities. And we did a paper several years ago, looking at sea lion personality across, you know, and, and trying to work with yeah. trainers and how we can, how they describe these different animals. There was a lot of agreement on different personalities of sea lions. And there's papers now on dolphins and elephants. And I, I do think it's humbling because when you start seeing the nature of their intelligence and realizing how we've treated many of these animals in the past and continue to, I think we really need to, again, wake up and uh, be aware of these animals and treat them with the respect that they deserve. Yeah, no, I agree with you. What what kind of um, interesting phenomena or behaviors have you seen from Newfoundlands or dolphins or elephants? Well, I'll focus on the, I'll, I'll focus on dolphins and elephants, mostly dolphins, because this, these are the species I've worked with for the past uh, 35 to 40 years. And, you know, we, what I tried to do in the beginning, we, I take two paths to my research. One is to try to decode their own forms of communication. And we work in Aquaria where we can do more controlled studies, but we also work in the field now studying them in the wild. And I think it's, you get very different data from those studies, as you can imagine. My colleague, Marcelo Magnasco, who's a biophysicist at the Rockefeller University in New York, I'm at Hunter College a couple blocks away. We've been working, uh, with funding from the National Science Foundation. We've been very fortunate. And we've developed um, some techniques to study them in the wild, use studying how they commu- may communicate and coordinate their activities when they bow ride. Bow riding is where you're, you're on, you see dolphins riding on the front of a boat on the wave, and they're yeah. highly synchronized. In fact, the ancient Greeks reported that, you know, the beauty of this synchronous behavior and people who go out on boats often will be lucky enough to see bow riding, but we don't really know how they coordinate and synchronize their behavior. So we've been using multiple GoPro cameras on two of these underwater recording balls. So, and then we record with an array of hydrophones so that when we're, when we piece it all together and reconstruct it and look at it through a visor, we can actually be in the pod. Dolphins groups are called pods and you can, you're in the water, you can look around, you can look up, down, and you're one of them. And we're in the infancy of this work now, but we can, we're now able to pretty much reconstruct movement of the animals and try to understand how they may be synchronizing. Again, this is in the beginning stages. Uh, We are also using aerial drones 
to observe animals from above now. There are these fabulous new tools we can use that are allow us to not interfere with them, to become as invisible as possible and watch them from above. And we see these patterns of behavior that we have. It's just impossible to see when you're on a boat. Sometimes oh, like what, on- like what's, an, what's an example. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Well, when we're looking at how they how they move, how they forage, one of the doctoral students in my lab, Eric Ramos, is, is just completing his doctoral work now, is, has been able to show in Belize, which is one of our study sites, how they're moving from area to area collectively and foraging in the different areas of Belize. And we're actually sort of seeing these super highways that they follow. Um, I don't want to spill the beans too much because he hasn't he hasn't defended his thesis yet. So I'll just hold it there where you can see how they're interacting from above where we wouldn't be able to see that. And we can also record their vocalizations from a, a more distant boat and then put the video from the from the drone together with our audio recordings and look at when they produce certain vocalizations as a group and correlate that with behaviors. And that's been very hard to do in the past. So those are some of the field studies we've done. And in the field, we also, um, some of my students and I published papers showing what we call visual laterality, bottlenose dolphins in Bimini, which is another field site we work with, with the dolphin communication project uh, that does great work. We go out with them on their boats and we've, we can watch bottlenose dolphins how the, their foraging abilities. Uh, they have two, there are two species we've been studying out there, bottlenose dolphins and spotted dolphins. And they often, they frequently interact, but with the bottlenose dolphins, they do what's called crater feeding, crater feeding. And what they'll do is they'll scan the bottom of, of the ocean and using echolocation to find where fish may be lying in the sand or hiding in the sand. And then when they find it, you'll hear, kind of a razor type of sound like and then all of a sudden you'll see a dolphin sort of make a sharp turn and orient with its right eye down towards the sand they kind of make this turn orienting their right eye and they burrow their head they bury their head up to their eyeballs they close their eyes and go in to the sand and pull out a fish that they've detected with echolocation. It's super cool. And wow. you know, you'll see groups of dolphins doing this and sometimes by it, by themselves or sometimes in synchrony with others. And when what, what we found that's really quite interesting is that dolphins, like other marine mammals who forage, seem to have a right eye bias. We talk about this as visual laterality, that they have highly specialized brains we said their mm-hmm. brains are second largest to their bodies, you know, in, in relation to their body size to a human brain. They have big, you know, complex brains. And they, it seems that a lot of very large brained animals have specialization. One side is specialized for certain things, the other side for others, you know, and there's some, there's obviously interplay between the two. But in this case, dolphins, like other marine mammals, seem to use their right eye which goes to the left hemisphere. And that seems to be what they orient when they to they orient to the prey when they go in and with uh, crater feeding. And we've also found in the same study in the field that uh, dolphins do what we call, here's another big one, biphonation. What do you think that means? Is that like two and third singing where they do two notes at the same time? Yep. So they they can produce two sounds at the same time. And we knew that um, it's been reported before this that dolphins can echolocate dolphins and some other marine mammals can echolocate and vocalize whistles and other sounds at the same time this was the first time we've seen evidence in this group for by for bilocation of even whistles as well as squawking and squawking and whistling so it, it's it's very interesting so those are some of the field studies that we've been doing and are continuing to do and then in aquaria i have a question uh, about uh about animals, uh, you know, people are left-handed, right-handed, ambidextrous, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Do animals have handedness or flipperness or legness or your yeah. example with the dolphins, they're using their right eye. So I guess, you know, the, that side of the brain and the opposite side is active, but again, do animals have handedness? Yeah. So we, th- some, so there is, there is evidence for 
quote unquote handedness in even non handed animals like dolphins. Different species, different species show different kinds of visual laterality or, or laterality in, the, in their movements, uh, in their movements and in, uh, how they use a paw, for example. And there's some splits, some, but different animals show bias, these, these side biases. What's interesting about dolphins is there's evidence coming from different outside of foraging from different labs that don't always agree. And that's where it gets interesting because it may be the way we're asking questions is not correct, or we have to refine our questions. So it's pretty consistent from most labs that are studying dolphins in the field that most marine mammals show a right eye bias in foraging. So what we found is, is really consistent with that. Have you found any, any in the population and have a left eye bias? Does yeah, that occur at all in dolphins? Yes. In fact, there was one. I'm glad you asked that. There was one animal out of the whole group that we looked at that, that showed a left eye bias. And I, 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 I don't want to, I, I hope I'm remembering this correctly. And I think that animal had a, had a bite out of its, one of its pec fins on the other side. So that may have influenced it because there are sharks out there that can cause injury. I hope I'm getting that right. We published that a while ago and I, I just haven't well, looked at it, but that was, that was a, that was a different situation that could account for that. Do they write like in a dolphin pod or whatever you want to call it? Do mm-hmm. they recognize other handedness or other eyeness? And do those left eye dolphins uh, have different roles in the pod? Uh, that's a great question. Do you want to sign up as a research assistant in my lab? <laughs> that's a great well, question. There- yeah, yeah, and my answer, yeah, it is interesting. And my question is, we don't know. I don't think we have enough data. I don't think we've asked that question yet, but it's a great question. And again, a lot of the time I say, I don't know, we don't know because we really don't. And right now we're doing a study. We've been studying dolphins in aquaria as well. And one of the things we we just are finishing now, some of the doctoral students in my lab are looking, we've been showing, uh, we created many years ago, we did a study giving the non-handed dolphin, a keyboard. And I like to say that because I say, well, how are they using this? I don't have hands, I don't have fingers. But this was, this was inspired by work that had been done with great apes by giving great, ape, teaching great apes an artificial code that they could use to communicate uh, and that we could investigate their cognitive ability. So people like Sue Savage Rumbaugh had, and Dwayne Rumbaugh had built these keyboards so that, that they had different symbols they could use that the great apes, bonobos and chimpanzees could use uh, to communicate. And that was fascinating work. And um, I got inspired by that. And I de- developed an underwater keyboard. This was in the mid 80s. We published this in the early 90s, where it was a three by three key matrix with white visual symbols on it. And if the dolphins pushed any of the keys, they would hear a particular computer generated whistle that was mm-hmm within the time and frequency domain of their own signals, but different in the whistle type. And what, so if you were one of the dolphins and let's say you, tr- you hit the triangle key, no matter where it appeared, because they appeared in different places, minute to minute, eventually, you'd hear <whistles> and you'd get a ball. And if hmm. you hit an H-shaped key, wherever it appeared, you'd hear a different sound like <whistles> And we tickle them or rub them. And so we looked at what their preferences were and then gave them these symbols or keys, visual keys that enabled them to ask for something. So it was giving them choice and control. And this is a big part of what I try to do is give other animals a means of a voice so we can hear what they want to, what their preferences are. And again, these are really rudimentary systems. We can barely do it. But I think instead of me training dolphins, I have very little interest in training dolphins to do things. I'm interested in giving them a means of showing us more about their minds, their ways. And that I like working with their, with the, as partnering with the dolphins. I, I try to say that I'm partnering with them as much as I can, giving them as much input. And then also that helps us with the decoding project where we're trying to understand. What have people noticed? Like, I think I remember Coco the gorilla had like this pad, this touch pad where it could touch different things or make signs and choose, you know, it could say I'm hungry or I'm tired or that kind of mm-hmm. thing. And I think with dogs too, I've seen people, they've had like some kind of pad that the dog walks on or it presses a certain key and it tells the person what the dog wants. So have you developed are these systems like that? Is that what they're well, so yeah, put this in perspective. So Penny Patterson was using a form of American sign language, but then at some point with Coco, with the gorilla, and then at some point Penny gave 
uh, gave her like an I- iPad as well. That was, this is, these are people who really led the way. Sue Savage Rambaugh, um, Roger and Debbie Fouts and the gardeners had been working with sign languages. This was in the seventies and eighties, continuing through the nineties, you know, the past years, these are long-term projects. Um, then we did our keyboard work, giving dolphins a keypad, you know, this keypad with choice and control. We did that in the mid eighties through the early, you know, mid eighties to the early nineties. And recently in the past couple of years, people have now started doing sort of uh, giving dogs more of a voice with programs like Fluent Pet, where those are the buttons that dogs or cats can use. And they can, they, and it's a citizen science project now. People can buy these things. And then if they, they train their pet to hit a, a, a button on a, on the floor and they're sort of in, uh, they're in, uh, floor sort of tiles, then they can they, they can hear something and then the owner can respond. I think we really have to have really good training programs. And I think the idea for Fluent Pet, because I'm kind of talking to those folks now, we just did a big, uh, well, I'll hold that for later, but they're-, they're but, have you, but have you collected all their observations? And if so, like, is there anything that jumps out at you? I'm not the person who developed Fluent Pet. I, the people who are doing this are- in the process of creating uh, approaches where the public can have a way to collect the data. So it goes in systematically. My understanding is right now they're reporting back to the folks who did Fluent Pet, but they want to make it much more systematic. And that's what's really needed if we're going to say anything. Because again, you know, it's fun to work with your pet and this is a great idea. But if we want to really get to what's really going on here, are the animals really communicating or is it just us over interpreting. I think we really need to have ways of, of charting that with the dolphins. We did that in the dolphins. What we had, we had a keyboard that was connected by fiber optic cables to a, a computer. So every key press where it was, what went on, what was going on behaviorally was videotaped was anal- we had a database that was charted by the computer was recorded in the computer and this has all been published uh in the past but we as i said we could barely do it the dolphins did amazing things not only did they use the keypad to ask for things but the dolphins quickly started to imitate the computer sounds and they started to show that they were associating those sounds with those objects or activities and often started to use them in very interesting and novel ways that was very reminiscent for me of early stages of child language acquisition. We never claimed it was like child language ac- language acquisition definitively, but it was very, they, we showed very similar patterns. For example, of uh, the dolphins we worked with after they had obtained a ball, they, we would often hear the, their productions of ball in the pool. And it was in specific contexts when they were either approaching a ball or interacting Hmm. with a ball, or they had just received it. Um, Very much like they they took it on themselves to call that thing the ball by whistling. Yeah, that's what it looks like. And then they, we also, also found evidence of them creating a novel sound that was a combination of ball and ring that they used uh, very frequently in the second half of the year it was a two year study. And it was in one context that they produced this when they, they had invented in the second year, a new game, which we called double toy play. And it's when they would get a ball and a ring from the keyboard and they would move away with it and then toss them together in the air and try to catch them at the same time in their mouths. Now that may seem simple, but it, that's no easy feat to get these things in their mouth at the same time. And in those contexts, we got the ball and ring sound in one continuous whistle. And that's important for a lot of reasons. First of all, we never reinforced it because we never knew what they were doing until we analyzed the tape afterwards. Secondly, they never heard that on the keyboard. So even if the dolphin hit for ball and then immediately hit for ring, there was always a half a second period of silence. So they never heard that ter- put together. The dolphins did this and they continued to do it across the second year. So that really helped us by it gave us a glimpse of maybe what they're doing in their own communication. Maybe they're doing combinations of signals. And that's very much what we're looking at right now. So that's where, you know, what when we give them a voice, we can that can often help us 
figure out what they're doing within their own communication. And now rather than using this more primitive keyboard, uh, my colleagues at Rockefeller and I have, have developed an underwater touchscreen for dolphins. It's a, f- a four by eight giant touchpad. It's like a dolphin. It's, we call it the D pad, the dolphin pad. And yeah. anything you can project on a computer, they can interact with. And uh, we're, we were supposed to be uh, doing, we did some preliminary work at the National Aquarium in Baltimore, and we're in the process of anal- still analyzing some of that data, but we showed them videos. We we worked with them on some preliminary studies. And it's very exciting. I'm hoping we can find a facility that we can do this in in the future. But what have you noticed about, uh, you know, when you give animals a way to communicate, what do you notice about their desires? You know, the pattern of it, the frequency, the intensity. Yeah, I th- think that's a great question. I think what's really important is to give animals more choice and control, to give them input. Because if you think about it, I mean, what we've known for, for such a long time is that not having control may not be a very good way in terms of, of means in terms of welfare. Most species, including our species, we have some control over our environment. And this we know the, the, what happens when an animal, human or non animal feels helpless, that nothing they do makes a difference. So I think for other animals, whether they're dogs or cats or dolphins or elephants or chips, giving them some way to get them something to happen, that what they do makes a difference. And in giving them ways of asking for things, hopefully communicating about other things, you know, it sounds a lot little like Dr. Doolittle, but when you actually mm-hmm. read that, that story, it's quite interesting. You know, it's so many of us have dreamed to have the ability to communicate with other animals, you know, to understand what they're communicating about, whether it's in sound or gesture or posture and decode and then entering into some kind of conversation. And um, now with computers, with AI, getting these big databases that we can analyze, whether it's supervised or unsupervised learning, I think it really holds this possibility for sort of a Google translate of other animals, but also coming up with interfaces that are powerful. I'm currently uh, the chair of a, a very, uh, of a very exciting program. Many of you may know of Peter Gabriel, the rock musician. And, mm-hmm. and, yeah. and, and so I work with Peter. He had this brilliant idea many years ago to start what he called the interspecies internet. Now, this is not animals surfing the net. Um, He wanted to think about a way to bring a forum of scientists, philosophers, people who study animal cognition and human cognition and AI folks uh, together to really think about how we can move forward in these areas of decoding the, la- the the communication of other animals and create abilities of animals to have choice and control and interfaces for communication. So Peter approached me and I joined his, this idea. And then Vince Cerf, who is actually the co-father, mm. co-founder of the internet, joined us along with Neil Gershenfeld, who's the director for the Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT. So the four of us, sounds like an unlikely group, the four of us are the co-founders and directors of the interspecies internet. I'm the chair of of the board. And we just had our third conference online this past weekend. We had an invited only scientist meeting on last Friday, which was um, July 30th. And then we had a public conversations event, which we hold every year the next day. So the, the public can join us. And these will be posted if anybody wants to see them online at Interspecies IO. All of our past conferences for the past three years will be posted there and two of them are already posted. Yeah. Again, like when you work with the animals, you know, you work with them and you listen and you're looking for things and you're, you know, you're paying full attention. So I I would think things would jump out at you that most people don't see in their communication. Like what are those things? Well, I, I, I'll give you examples. So, for example, we one of the things that I noticed in just watching dolphins years ago was that they seemed to pay attention to when there was a reflective surface. They often looked at that. For example, if the if you get a differential light on a on a window in an aquarium, often it will be mirror like. So, back in two thousand and one, my colleague and I, my colleague Laurie Marino and I, published a paper showing dolphins like us and great apes had the cognitive sophistication to show, to be able to recognize themselves in a mirror. And that was based again on some observations we had made earlier. And then we tested it. And many, and five years later, I conducted another study showing 
Asian elephants also show mirror self-recognition. I did that with my colleagues, Franz Duval, who's a primatologist, and Josh Plotnick, who now studies uh, elephants. He's Josh is with me at Hunter College in our animal behavior and conservation program there. So we did. So right now we know that humans, a, ha- a small handful of animals show mirror self-recognition. Several have been tested, but it seems to be right now that it's humans non-human apes. Uh, so we see it in chimpanzees, bonobos, orangutans, gorillas, monkey species don't seem to show this, which is interesting. Um, we showed it in dolphins. We showed it, demonstrated it in elephants and also magpies show it. And those are the animals that seem to definitively show it. What's curious is that most of those animals have shown strong evidence for empathy. We don't know enough about magpies yet. And they all have very large and complex brains uh, relative to their body size. They're sort of way up there and they're very socially sophisticated species. So we're thinking that even though we don't have the magic sauce or the recipe to say, gee, if you have this, this, and this, you show me your self-recognition, certain right. things do cluster together. And then we also showed one of the students in my lab, Rachel Morrison, uh, did her doctoral work with me showing that very young dolphins also show mere self-recognition and show it even earlier than human children. And that doesn't mean that they're smarter. It means that their developmental trajectory is is earlier so that they show more independence and more social sophistication and awareness at a younger age than do human children because dolphins kind of hit the water swimming, you know, really almost immediately after they're born. And it's just a different developmental trajectory. What's interesting- Yeah, just imagine the magpie going, Diana. Ah. Yeah, right, right. No, it, it was- say your name, you know? Yeah. What's remarkable about this is when you look across these, when you look at how animals react to themselves, when they're looking, when they show mirror self-recognition, they show strikingly similar behaviors and patterns when they go through it. So most animals, if they've never seen a mirror, if they're mirror naive, they'll show social behavior because they think it's another of their own kind. Why wouldn't they? they Yeah. And then once they, then they go through the second stage, which we call mirror testing or contingency testing, where they start doing these unusual repetitive behaviors. Um, I always like to show this little video when I give talks of Groucho Marx or Harpo Marx in front of a mirror where they do these weird behaviors to their own image, trying to figure out, hey, is that me or not? Then that's the stage where the light bulb seems to go on when, when they see these repetitive behaviors and then, then from there, they show this third stage, which we call self-directed, where they start using the mirror as a tool to view themselves. And they may look very closely at their eyes. Many of the animals will look inside their mouths. Right. Yeah, they look wow. at their genitals. I mean, this is what we see with children in early stages. So seeing these huh. striking similarities, again, they have so much in common in this respect with us. And um, I seriously hope that we take these reflections of other minds and put them into protecting these animals because elephants are getting slaughtered daily. Dolphins are dying in these nets in Japan. If any of you've seen the cove, I was actually the scientist who told the filmmaker about dolphins being slaughtered in Japan and these Taiji dolphin drives. We're still trying to stop this. Whales are being caught in nets, in these nets off of the coast in Japan. And uh, unfortunately, you know, they're, they, they're being killed in horribly inhumane ways. It's so for many scientists, I think it's, uh, I know I've certainly tried, been trying to do this is speaking out on their behalf because they can't speak out for themselves at this point and trying right. to stop this. So very important. That so what's, um, well, so again, now that you've studied animal minds, I, you know, I understand some of the things that you've observed, but um, I don't know, do animals live in the present? Do they look into the future? Do they get anxious? Do they, you know, like, how close are they to us? Like, what, what's unique about us that's either good or bad that doesn't seem to show up in any of the animals you studied? Yeah, well, I think these are all great questions. When we think about, when we think about what they're communicating about, I mean, there are lots of studies that have been done, for example, showing that some species have alarm calls that they use to alert others in their group and that those animals, that those alarm calls, for example, in vervet monkeys, they'll seem to represent those predators. It's not just a generalized alarm call. So somehow there are what the, it's been termed semantic calls. They have meaning. So if vervet monkeys are in a group and there's a martial eagle, which is a predator and it flies above them, they'll, an animal may produce a particular alarm call and the other vervets will look up 
where that predator may be. And then they go to an escape route that's in a bush. Whereas if it's a a leopard, that's also a predator. They'll look in the direction, a different direction when they hear that. And they'll go up into a tree rather than hiding in a bush where a leopard could pick them up. If they do a, a, a different call that represents a snake call, they'll get up on their tippy toes, look around the ground and then go up. So they show the right response to those sounds when a con- when a member of their own group emits it and then go to these appropriate escape routes. And, you know, when you do science, you do have to do these controls. So the folks that did this study did a playback out of a speaker, a playback study where you put the sounds back into the environment when there's no other animal there and see how do they react just to the sound itself. And you still get those responses. Because you can imagine, you know, another alternative would be, let's say you're a vervet on the ground and you hear the yeah. call of like a, a eagle call. You might just look at the signaler because you could localize this, you know, who's vocalizing and see that that signaler is looking up. And then that would cue you look up because they're looking up. This uh-huh. eliminated, controlled for that. So all they're getting is a hidden, you know, they just hear the sound coming from a bush area. They can't see the the, the mechanical speaker and they look uh-huh. up in that direction. And these are the kinds of things we have to do as scientists. So we're not over-interpreting the data. They're, we have to use controls. I was going to share one other of my favorite studies with you as sure. well. So many years ago, another one of the doctoral students in my lab, Preston Furter, uh, all these students are out there running their own labs now, which makes me feel very proud. But Preston Furter was in our lab, my lab, and we did a study at the National Smithsonian's National Zoo with Asian elephants. And we had done studies there looking at mirror self-recognition there, as well as the Bronx Zoo. We're getting ready to publish another paper showing more elephants also show mirror self-recognition now. But we did a study looking at problem solving in it in Asian elephants. And the thing that spurred us to do this particular study was that we know elephants are super smart. We know that they can use tools to scratch their back, to pry open things. And a paper came out by some colleagues saying that it's interesting that Asian elephants and that don't seem to use tools to solve problems in any kind of insightful way. And that maybe they have a very savant type of brain. Maybe they, they're really good at remembering the source where, where water is and doing certain things, but it's kind of, you know, very focused on certain things. Why don't, you know, that they're not showing a certain level of sophisticated sophistication and problem solving. And I looked at the problems they gave them and it just didn't seem, it just seemed like we could do something a little different to try to get at this. So we set up a study at at Smithsonian's National Zoo that was based on a study, the first study to show insightful problem solving in chimpanzees. This was a a study that was done um, many, many years ago in in Tenerife in the Canary Islands, where chimpanzees, this is the original study, where chimpanzees were, uh, had uh, banana hung out of their reach on a rope above their heads. And they were given crates and sticks on the ground. And the scientists watched to see what they would do. And eventually what the chimps did is they uh, they wound up stacking these crates, picking up a stick and getting the banana down. And this was the first report of insightful problem solving, because up to that point, the chimps had not done anything. They just kind of watched. They didn't show any evidence for trial and error where they figured it out by trying X, Y, and Z. And then finally, this one worked. It was kind of one of those uh aha moments, you know, that we've all experienced. So we did a similar study where we went at National Zoo. We suspended from above, we sort of hang, hung out a long rope, like a laundry line, high above the uh, trunk reach of, el- an el- of an elephant. And we hung what's called brows. It's bre- leaves that have sort of were baited with tasty treats, extra food. The, ele- the, the elephants were fed well ahead of time because we don't want to work with hungry animals. And then we sent it out and we gave them their, we, and we, sh- we found that just like the chimps, when they couldn't reach it, we found that the, I mean, oh, wait, I'm sorry, we put, st- a, a, you know, something for them to stand on. Uh, we put a variety of different objects out and sticks. Now, in these earlier studies with elephants, they found that elephants did not pick up sticks to get things out of their reach. Okay. And that's what led okay. these scientists to say they weren't showing insight. You know, elephants use sticks. Here, we gave them the option of using sticks to knock this fruit down or to get up 
and stand up on it. And what we found was the elephants immediate one once they use something because the, the elephant was kind of watched for the first several trials not doing anything kind of looking at this looking frustrated and then the first time it did anything he moved this stand this box directly under the brows that he wanted to get stood up on it and pulled it down with his trunk and then as we did additional sessions we would move this location and every time he would start looking for this this box, move it, push it to where it had to go and stand on it. He never picked up a stick. He could have easily picked up a stick and knocked it down. And I think that um, what's interesting is if you don't give them options, you may come to the false conclusion. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we th- that I think like an elephant or the student I was working with did, but we tried to. And what's really interesting about elephants are is that I think they have to get their trunk to where the good stuff is. Their trunk, uh, an Asian elephant has two little fingers at the end of their trunk, two little points, and they can pick up things as small as a dime. So in this case, I think it's getting the elephant giving the elephant um, a way of getting its trunk to where the food was so it can smell it and grab it. And by the way, it turns out we learned after this study that the best visual acuity the elephant has for near range is at the tip of the trunk, which if you think about it, makes sense. That's where they, they're, they're sticking their trunk out to get things. So yeah. it, again, it's partnering as much as we can designing our projects with the sensory systems and the perceptions of these animals as much as we know it in mind. And often if we don't do that, you know, we're thinking how we humans would do it. And us, you know, we would pick up a stick and knock it down, but elephants have a trunk and um, it's thinking again, that's how they do it. And then we saw that they showed insightful problem solving here. It'd be funny if uh, you're able to get one of these, you know, smaller elephants into a room and you do a, you know, you start speaking and you address the elephant in the room. <laughs> Absolutely. Believe me, I've used that line multiple times. It's, they're fascinating, but it's, it's been really an honor to work with these animals and try to uh, help in their protection as much as we can. Are there any examples I haven't asked about that just shocked you? Like you, you haven't even finished processing what happened maybe even from years ago, but you just, it just sticks with you and it's a mystery to you, but you're trying to figure it out. Well, I think that I'll give you a little. So many years ago, I was involved. I do. I did a lot of dolphin and whale rescue. So when animals, these animals will often strand for many reasons that are unknown to us. Some of the time we think they strand because of pollution, uh, anthrop- anthropocentric uh, noise can have an effect or toxins in our water water areas, waterways, coastal areas. And back in um, 1985, a big humpback whale that we named Humphrey wandered into San Francisco Bay. And he was there for several weeks. It, he turned out to be a she in the end, but we didn't know that at the time. And I was involved. I was one of the people involved in the rescue. And um, I won't have time to go into lots of details. I actually have a book called The Dolphin in the Mirror. And that's the first chapter I, I talk about this wet rescue. It was one of those things that still sticks with me. This whale went about 60 miles inland up into through, uh, it came into San Francisco Bay, walk, went, worked its way up, his way up into uh, different, through different bays, was wound up in these little sloughs, which are these narrow waterways. And we wound up using a variety of methods to get the whale back out to open ocean. And we actually did using playback where we played uh, the sounds of humpback whales feeding and the whale followed our boat back. And it was a remarkable journey for all of us. Um, The whale, you know, was always behind us. We never really saw its eye until, except with one one time. And once it went out into San Francisco Bay, we got it through the Golden Gate Bridge. It went in the wrong direction again. It was, this whale had been on a Southern course for, uh, you know, in terms of the southern the, the migration into warmer waters of Baja down the California coast. And unfortunately, we were hoping it would continue when we got it out of this area, but it went north. And I was in charge of this playback operation. So I had all these other small boats around our boat. This was right outside of the Golden Gate Bridge where we were waiting and watching and hoping he would go the right way or way. I'm going to say they because he was a she. So I'll just use the pronoun they, um, that they would go the right way. 
And um, nobody saw this whale. We had seen it disappear north. We had this flotilla. If you're from a bird's eye view, we were in the center. We pulled up this big speaker that we were projecting the sounds. So our boat looked just like all these other boats. And then we had a U.S. Coast Guard boat. We had uh, a big U.S. geological boat uh, around us. It was a city on the sea. And we were in the center. And I told everybody, turn off all of your motors. We just need to listen. And we just want to watch for for this whale. And it was 10 minutes, 15 minutes, no sign of this whale. And suddenly the whale appears at our boat, had come back to our own, our boat didn't go to any of the other boats because everybody was watching and um, had, and came up and pressed its belly to our boat and was looking up at us with this big wet eye and all of us. Yeah, it was amazing. You know, we, we all really felt like we had saved this whale and somehow this whale knew it and came back in some way, understanding something about what had transpired. Now this was back in 1985 and we didn't know. And then by the way, the whale went off in the right direction. Okay. And was sighted later, months later, down with other humpbacks in the Farallon Islands, you know, south of us. So that was, that was good to hear. But now we're getting more and more reports of humpbacks having this showing behavior suggestive, uh, suggestive of empathy. Now we've had reports of this with dolphins. I've observed it myself, but with a whale and with humpback whales, it seems that people have been observing, and these are scientists, other scientists, where they seem to come to the rescue of other animals that are being attacked, even other animals that are not their own species. And, you know, when I heard that, and there's some news, there's some new reports of people being helped by humpbacks, it really makes you think, and for me, it's always stuck with me, what was Humphrey really doing when they came back? And uh, that's always stuck with me, as well as these other close encounters with uh, dolphin mines. It's um, I think they are much more aware than we've given them credit for. And I hope, again, in closing, I just want to suggest that we become more aware and more empathetic with with them, showing them the empathy that they deserve. Last question. I know we got to go. That's just about top of the hour. But um, has anyone like probably maybe the easiest animal to do this with would be dogs or mice? Or I don't know. But has anyone had a couple of dogs in a room that was instrumented like crazy? Like you could see an infrared, you could see, you could hear, you could see, you could feel, you could, there was a bunch of cameras going. I mean, there was like every possible way of monitoring the interactions of, you know, let's say two dogs interacting. Uh So you, you know, not just sight, but sound and again, smell and just again, instrumented to heck so that you could, you could try to capture every possible interaction the dogs had that may be missed yeah. only when you're looking. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, there are a couple of projects that are are hoping to do this. First of all, I have to s- do a shout out for our own project because we this is what we're trying to do with dolphins. We instrumented the National Aquarium underwater and in air where we had cameras, we had arrays of hydrophones that could localize sound so we could record their sounds and their behaviors, their movements. That was funded by the National Science Foundation. We're hoping to re-implement this. We had to call that to an abrupt halt because National Aquarium, I'm proud to say, has decided to create the first dolphin sanctuary, which is really wonderful. And I've been involved in that project, uh, in instigating that project. Right now, there's another really exciting project with with sperm whales that's called Project SETI, C-E-T-I, where um, a very large group of scientists just got a TED Audacious Award for millions of dollars with that same goal in mind to have multiple sensory uh, sensors to try to track sperm whales. So I think at least in the field of marine mammals, you know, this is a direction I think a lot of us are moving into. Very cool. Well, Diana, it's been really good to talk to you. Um, where can people keep tabs on your work and see your latest adventures? Where do they go? Yeah, well, they can look at our uh, website, which we're updating now. It's m 2 c 2 um, and it's if you put my name in, it'll come up again. This is getting updated. We'll also, look at interspecies internet interspecies io for what we're doing with interspecies internet. That has their Slack channels they can join. It tells about the conferences we're having, and again, it represents a lot of scientists. And then, if anybody's interested, we have will be we have a website. It's called the Adam, It's um, Hunter College ABC program, where if people are interested in learning more about uh, programs that are offered for masters programs and animal behavior, they can check out that website. All right. Very good. Well, Diana, it's really cool work you're doing and thank you for being on the podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me. This has been a pleasure. Great talking to you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. 
You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.